let me welcome you, everybody, uh, at this special event of Journal Club uh, that is organized by the EASD Academy in collaboration with Diabetologia. And we have a uh, special honor today to invite uh, among us Theresia Sarabhai, who is an early career uh, clinical researcher at, um, uh, at German Diabetes Center in Dusseldorf. And uh, before we let uh, her present, the, uh, the scientific word uh, she's, present, uh, she's prepared for us. Let me briefly introduce her. Uh, she's a physician by the education. And uh, as I said, she currently works in, in Dusseldorf and um, uh, she has an impressive track of records. Uh, there's 25, uh, 21 publications in uh, uh, Web of Science that I uh, had the opportunity to go through. And uh, she actually, it was two years, she got a key scientific leader program, uh, Novo Nordisk grant. And uh, this year she got uh, Sylvia King Prize uh, of German Diabetes Association. So it is a great honor to have you here today, Theresia. And uh, uh, let us uh, uh, let us hear your presentation on the on the recent paper that you uh, that you uh, uh, published in uh, Diabetologia, and that is hyperbaric oxygen uh, rapidly improves tissue specific insulin sensitivity and mitochondrial capacity in humans with type two diabetes. Uh, the results of a randomized placebo controlled crossover trial. So, Theresia, uh, the the stage is yours. Jan, thank you so much for the brief introduction, the very um, kind introduction, actually. Um, I will start right in. Can you see my screen, everyone? Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So thank you again for inviting me to ESD Journal Club. I'm really honored um, to be able to present our recent work here. Um, you already uh, named the title of the paper, I will not repeat it. However, today we will talk about hyperbaric oxygen therapy, which is really interesting and very rare also in clinical practice. Brief introduction. Various studies before have suggested a causal relationship between oxidative stress and insulin resistance, which is an early hallmark of type 2 diabetes. So I'm from the German Diabetes Center, so therefore we are really interested in type 2 diabetes and wanted to further understand mechanisms involved in the development of insulin resistance, which... Uh, is um, not only a side effect um, or not only the only product of a type of diabetes, however, we also see their lipotoxicity, low grade inflammation, impaired muscle mitochondrial function, all these are characteristics of diabetes. And uh, therefore we want to further understand its association to oxidative stress. In humans with obesity, whole body insulin resistance um, was also found to be positively um, associated with a white tissue um, hypoxia, in short VAT, used here, the VAT uh, as a short form for white adipose tissue. Um, also, there was an association for uh, between insulin resistance and um, inflammation or higher inflammation levels and oxidative stress. So um, all these abnormalities in the pathogenesis of type 2 diabetes are interesting for us. And recent studies um, on long-term hyperbaric oxygen treatment for um, the, for the um, diabetic foot syndrome actually also showed a nice side effect, a lowered um, blood glucose levels. So a working group of Australia around Wilkinson et al, they studied in a very impressive work um, several times how uh, people with obesity um, who went for HBO therapy in, in a row for four until 20 consecutive days um, showed an increased whole body insulin sensitivity and lower blood glucose levels and also lower systemic um, concentration of certain inflammatory cytokines. So we aimed to further analyze the underlying mechanisms of this HPO um, mediated um, improved whole body insulin sensitivity. Therefore, we also further um, investigated the concept of mitohormesis, which is a low dose um, concentration of reactive oxygen substrates, um, which um, developed during the process of mitochondrial oxidation. And these low dose um, ROS 
do not only cause damage to different tissues and um, also cause oxidative stress, but also in this concept are um, argued to have a signaling molecule function in, and inducing protective response um, mechanisms against metabolic challenges to enhance oxidative capacity. So we also wanted to further analyze that. Therefore, our hypothesis was that HBO improves skeletal muscle insulin sensitivity via decreased oxidative stress. And therefore, um, we compared the acute effects of one single session of 100% oxygen treatment with ambient air um, oxygen treatment, which is 21%, um, both delivered at 400 and 240 kilopascal compression. So you have to imagine, I'll also show you a picture, um, the hyperbaric oxygen treatment, it actually looks like a closed chamber and there are several seats in there. 12 patients can be, um, can be treated at once. The patient goes into this chamber and in this chamber they get a mask where they breathe 100% oxygen or ambient air over and then um, the ambient pressure is um, varied um, according to how how much pressure you want to induce. So it equals to going diving uh, 11 meters under the surface of the water. This is a similar pressure um, as you have in the, in the hyperbaric chamber. So we um, studied type two um, humans with type two diabetes on tissue specific glucose metabolism. Um, tissue specific insulin sensitivity, skeletal muscle and bat mitochondrial capacity, oxidative stress and antioxidative capacity and insulin signaling and skeletal muscle uh, in total. Herefore, we employed different methods. We took uh, muscle and bat biopsies. We um, did, an, uh, we did hyperinsulinemic oligoclemic clamps and uh, we also employed different um, Western blot and PCR techniques. Our primary endpoint was, was rate of disappearance from hyperinsulinemic oligoclemic clamp with Fraser infusion. Our study design was quite uh, adventurous. It comprised of two consecutive, uh, consecutive days. We had uh, four periods. Basal period started on day one after 12 hour fast, eight, um, 8 a.m. in the morning. Patients arrived at the German Diabetes Center. First, uh, they went into um, phosphorus and um, liver fat uh, measurements of via a magnetic resonance spectrometry. After that, we measured indirect calliometry and then we took a muscle and fat biopsies. Then they returned the next day, six in the morning, uh, again, after 12 hour fast. They had, uh, after a blood withdrawal, they had to go to the hyperbaric oxygen chamber for treatment. Um, it was a randomized study, so we didn't know whether they received 100% um, oxygen treatment or 21% ambient air oxygen treatment. Um, patients were there for 120 minutes, came back to German Diabetes Center, and then we started the preclamp period. So in the preclamp -pre period from um, hour zero to two, we actually again took muscle and fat biopsies, hourly blood withdrawals, then another MRS um, uh, examination, another indirect cardiometry examination, and then we started hyperinsulinemic oligarchemic clamp for four hours. During that clamp technique, we again took um, a muscle and a fat biopsy, and uh, no, only a muscle biopsy, and then after a five hours, um, in, uh, five hours, uh, okay, after, um, after the HBO therapy. So in total, after eight hours on that day, we were done and, two, uh, and the visit was completed. Then the patients came back after uh, two to three weeks um, because it was a, a crossover study and um, the whole um, visit was started again. Um, this table one, I want to show the demographic and clinical characteristics of our study co cohort. It was a small study. 12 participants were included, all males, Caucasian, with a mean age of 58 and a body mass index of 30. Um, body fat was about 31% in, um, in mean. And um, partic participants had a known diabetes 
with a duration of five years plus minus two years um, with a moderate well-controlled diabetes with an HB1AC of 7% and an M value of three. Um, all participants were on metformin, um, met, metformin uh, treatment only. We asked them or we kept them on metformin only because uh, we wanted to have it equal among every study. Um, participants, however, did not want them without any treatment at all. So um, at this point, every one of you must be thinking, okay, what does um, hyperbolic oxygen treatment actually do? Because as we all know um, from clinical implications, um, people should have, um, should have like blood oxygen levels about 98 to 100%. These are physiological, um, phys physiological levels and we should not have any less that would be pathological. And uh, therefore, what can um, actually hyperbaric oxygen chamber provide us with? So um, when we breathe 100% oxygen in an in a atmospheric pressure of 240 kilopascal, we actually do not only um, saturate our hemoglobin in our blood, the, the red blood part, um, we don't, do not only saturate this up to 100%, but we also dissolve more oxygen into our blood in general. So fourfold, fourfold higher levels of um, physically dissolved oxygen in our blood can be found during and after hyperbaric oxygen treatment with 100% or two. And this is the difference between normal ambient breathing. So this is very important. And this we actually wanted to measure here for we employ two different methods. The finger pulse um, oximetry to measure blood oxygen saturation levels, and then also the transcutaneous tissue oxygen measurement to measure tissue, ox tissue oxygen levels, not only the blood oxygen levels. And here in the table, first we can see the blood oxygen levels, which were um, physiological for the control as well as the HBO group. 97% um, in the mean, and uh, it actually did not like change over the time period of the visit. However, the transcutaneous tissue, tissue oxygen levels, TCPO2, seen in the second row, were significant, significantly higher um, during hyperbaric oxygen treatment and also afterwards, which can be seen at minus 1.5 hour and zero hour for our participants in the HPO group in comparison to CON. So this is actually the difference that we achieve with 100% oxygen breathing in the hyperbaric oxygen chamber. Looking at our results here, I can um, show you the time course of circulating metabolites and hormones in humans with type 2 diabetes before and after HBO or CON treatment. And panel A, you can see that um, blood glucose levels were lower um, after HBO in comparison to control, starting from time point zero after HBO treatment um, up to the start of the clamp. Um, there and this uh, lower levels can be seen over a longer period um, during our um, study. Insulin levels were not significantly different of between um, HBO and CON only for time point 120. There were no difference seen between groups for um, the non-estified fatty acids, NIFA and short form the three acylglycerols. Next, I want to talk about um, our sorry. I want to talk about our findings for whole body and tissue specific um, glucose and lipid metabolism after HBO and CON. Here in um, our panel, we can see our pre-clamp um, results. In panel A, rate of um, disappearance for glucose was not different during fasting state. However, glucose oxidation uh, levels are rate of glucose oxidation was higher um, for HBO in comparison to control already during the fasting state, um, hepatic insulin resistance uh, measured by EGP multiplied by insulin levels was actually lower for the HBO group in comparison to control during the fasting state and adipose tissue insulin resistance was also lower after HBO in control in comparison to control. During the clamp period, we can see similar results. Rate of disappearance as a measurement for whole body um, 
whole body insulin sensitivity was higher um, after HBO as a uh, comparison to control rate of glucose oxidation was higher. Um, EGP suppression as measurement for hepatic insulin sensitivity was higher as well as NIFA suppression as measurement for adipose tissue insulin sensitivity was higher as well. So we see HBO leads to an improvement of hepatic skeletal muscle and butt insulin sensitivity. Next, I want to show you the variables of tissue-specific um, energy metabolism and antioxidative capacity um, after um, HBO and CON treatment in the humans and humans with type 2 diabetes. So here in row, in the first row, A, B, C, we can see that liver ATP levels, um, the delta is actually the comparison between after HBO treatment in comparison to before. So it's, multi, um, it's subtracted, it's minus. So we can see that our delta is higher for liver ATP concentrations after CON in comparison, um, after HBO in comparison to CON. So we have higher ATP production um, also when related to phosphorus metabolites. We have no difference for interhepatic lipids, which is not surprising then you can see that maximum mitochondrial respiration for muscle is higher after HPO. We can see that there is um, higher um, oxidative production of mitochondria in muscle after HPO. And we can also see that the ratio of um, total glutathione to oxidized glutathione, which is a measurement for tissue antioxidative capacity is also higher uh, in muscle after HBO in comparison to control. Looking at the adipose tissue, we can see also here very similar higher mitochondrial respiration for uh, white adipose tissue after HBO in comparison to control, higher oxidative production, but also higher antioxidative capacity after HPO in comparison to control. Next, um, I want to show you the myocellular um, endoplasmatic reticulum stress and um, insulin signaling after HBO and CON in humans with type 2 diabetes. Also during the fasting state here, we can see that um, the eukaryotic um, initiation factor to alpha in short form E IF2A, which is a marker for oxidative um, stress, yeah, um, actually is not different in total. However, the phosphorylated form, the activated form is lower, and um, then the ratio is lower as well in comparison to control. When we look at the insulin receptor substrate one, which is not different in total, however, the phosphorylated um, insulin receptor substrate one at serine 1101 is lower in comparison to control. And um, also the ratio there, we can see a decrease after HBO and control. Here we can see, okay, actually HBO does um, improve insulin cellular, muscle cellular insulin signaling. And um, when we look during the clamp period for AKT and phosphorylated AKT serine 473, as well as the ratio, also here we can see improved insulin signaling um, after HBO in comparison to control. So I want to sum it up. And herefore, I um, want to show you this graphical abstract. So after um, hyperbaric oxygen treatment with 100% um, oxygen breathing for humans with type 2 diabetes, we can see that the hyperoxygenation has different effects. So only one single treatment of HPO um, actually rapidly improves insulin sensitivity and uh, leads to lower blood, gl blood glucose levels and improves insulin receptor signaling in, in, in general. Here, this is a signaling cascade then the one single treatment of HPO with 100% oxygen breathing also leads to a marked improved mitochondrial functionality. So um, we can see uh, a better prep cycle. We can see higher ADP to ATP turnover. We can see better, um, better oxidation um, rates 
after HPO and comparison control, uh, which also leads to higher antioxidative capacity and uh, might uh, lead to lower ATF4 and 6 uh, levels. These data have not been shown by me yet. However, in the supplement of the paper, you can find them a little bit decreased in comparison after HBO in comparison to control, which is also um, a marker for lower um, stress levels. These uh, effects after um, HBO treatment were found in the myocyte. However, also in the hepatocyte, we were able to show um, similar um, results, at least what we were able to measure non-invasively non -invasively by uh, the mag magnetic resonance spectrometry. Here we found higher um, ATP levels, so a better and better um, mitochondrial function as can be translated and um, yeah, further studies uh, better in mice uh, would uh, show or like in, in rodents in general could show even more results for liver in the future. Thank you so much. I um, hope this was very interesting to you and I'm open for questions now. Okay, Theresia, thank you very much. That was an impressive presentation. And uh, before I, I before I give a word to the audience to talk about this uh, these interesting findings, uh, let me first ask you um, one let's say obligate question. Uh, as I told you, this um, journal club is also aimed to early career scientists, so we would be very happy if you could share with us uh, your thoughts on whether there were any specific turning points uh, in terms of funding, leadership or uh, any suggestion uh, you could share with us uh, so that we all can get these impressive results as you did. Thank you, thank, thank you so much, uh, at, uh, first of all, Jan. Um, basically, I, I would say it's persistence. I don't know whether you would uh, agree with me or not. However, um, not at every point in my career, people believed in me or actually thought, okay, she's doing a great job or work or whatsoever. However, I always tried my best and said, let's continue, let's do it. And um, I would say lots of hard work as, as well. So this study took me about three years to uh, perform and um, there were many drawbacks. I would have wished to include more participants, uh, but at a certain point, um, I think it's important also to have um, people around you who tell you, okay, it's fine, it's good, let's let's analyze it, let's um, move forward. And um, yeah, so I would say persistence and hard work. <laughs> Great, that's exactly what we wanted to hear. Um, <laughs> So let, let me proceed to the hardcore scientific thoughts. So I will start with the first questions that we made up uh, within the ESD Academy, and then I will hand over to, uh, to the audience. Uh, hyperbaric oxygen was also shown to have hemodynamic effects. Uh, so um, uh, could maybe these uh, effects you observed be also attributable to uh, increased perfusion of the tissue? And that's, that's one question. And uh, a follow-up question is actually, uh, how did you, you mentioned in the uh, in the method section that you uh, control for um, uh, relevant angiopathies? Mm -hmm. Could you specifically uh, say what is it? Because uh, of course the the, perf the tissue perfusion could be uh, perceived as a major uh, confounder of the of the results. Yes. So first of all, hemodynamic effects by um, hyperbaric oxygen treatment. Yes. Um, they are hemodynamic effects. However, um, I would say they're not even in our favor because um, the, the cardiac output is lower. The people have, um, um, have often um, low um, um, blood pressure after um, HPO. So for, for us, and also as we did a crossover study to rule out any bias like this, and also when we look at medication and other factors, we did not really see, um, uh, we would, or we did not expect that um, hemodynamic effects would, would affect uh, insulin signaling in general. Um, tissue specific um, hyperoxygenation was at some point our, our main 
main or primary endpoint, like no, it wasn't our primary endpoint, however, was an exploratory um, endpoint. First of all, we wanted to see what is really uh, going on with insulin signaling and uh, whole body insulin sensitivity. So for, I think due to study design, any effects of HBO, the hemodynamic effects should be ruled out. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. I mean, uh, from the pragmatic point of view, it does not actually matter what are the mechanisms, but it seems to work a bit and uh, any other uh, possible intervention that we may have to sensitize our patients with type 2 diabetes uh, besides the pharmacotherapy is, um, uh, is a nice, uh, nice result. So uh, let me now uh, ask the audience if there are any questions uh, for Theresia please feel free to ask. And I will hand over my word to Katerina, who would moderate the discussion. Hi, ah, yes, I see there is a raised hand by Sandra Smink. So please, Sandra, what's your question? Thank you. Thank you, Teresa, for this very interesting uh, talk. I was wondering um, if you know something about uh, how long this effect lasts, because how and how you then would implement it in the in the clinic, do they need to do this on a weekly basis, or is once enough, or how 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 can I see this in the, for for the patient? Thank you, Sandra, for this very interesting question. So, um, as we all know, um, this study was only a very like sh like was an, was investigating acute effects. However, there have been uh, studies performed who looked into the long term effects and they saw um, even after a week that participants still um, uh, had benefited from um, they in this and that study they did four um, four HBO sessions after each other and then after a week we invited the participants and saw that still blood glucose levels were lower and insulin sensitivity, but um, measured by HOMA ER was still lower. So for a week, at least we know they do profit from hyperbaric um, treatment. However, I wouldn't say it will last lifelong. So obviously they still have to take medication and have to do, um, have to do lifestyle um, interventions. But um, in general, for the clinical, for the clinical aspect, um, at least in Germany, um, the general insurance pays for these treatments over 30 days, 15 to 30 days, uh, for participants with major diabetic complications as diabetic foot syndrome. And um, here participants um, who have to be hospitalized for that, um, for that time timeline, they profit with lower blood glucose levels, lower need of medication, and um, actually um, also hopefully in that time learn to manage their diabetes better and then profit over the long run. Cool, thank you. Yeah, so if there are any other questions, please feel free to ask, raise your hand, or you can also use the chat if you don't want to talk. But, uh, so. I, have, I have another question. Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> please, go ahead. So I was wondering, I saw that you used only males in your study, right? That's probably a good reason for that. But I was wondering if you have any idea how, if the effect will be the same for female. Yeah, we actually wanted to also investigate uh, into that. So um, from, from a general point, there should be no reason why it wouldn't be working in females. However, we also wanted to include female participants. This was one of the drawbacks I'm really regretting. I did not find many um, female participants who were willing to go through this study design, also with the multiple biopsies, to be honest. Um, so I would have loved to like study more females but uh, there were none to be found. <laughs> Other studies, therefore, however, they included females and they did not, like, I can't remember any study who really looked into differences between male and female. However, they did not really report on any differences. So I think there haven't been any. Oh, that's interesting. I thought maybe you decided to do only male because they don't have the complicated hormones yeah. during this the month. 
You're right, uh, Sandra. Actually, this has to be considered. So we always try um, to to examine females uh, during a, fo a follicular follicular phase of their cycle. However, um, also many diabetics are when they have a mean age of 58, they're a little older, and then perhaps they're in menopause, and it wouldn't be even even be any trouble for us. But uh, my problem actually was recruiting participants. This was really difficult for that study. Okay. Well, thank you. So, Teresa, what do you think uh, the next steps are? Because uh, so uh, these uh, HPO uh, therapies are reimbursed for uh, diabetes compl diabetes complications, but do you think it could be you know a useful um, a supplemental therapy for? Uh, uh, helping people with diabetes improve their glycemic control. So what do you think the next steps are to implement uh, this therapy, to see if it, it's, you know, worth implementing this uh, therapy in clinical practice, not just in people with complications, but also, you know, just as a, uh, another therapy to improve uh, glycemic control. Mm, thank you, Katarina. Yeah, so in general, um, I have no idea whether it's, economically um, working if it's an in, like a therapy for participants without complications um, because then we have so many alternative um, um, possible like, alternatives like lifestyle interventions uh, dietary interventions which work really good as we know however um, I feel like for especially as it's already approved for diabetic foot syndrome and also improves um, tissue um, oxygen levels, I would say it's really important for uh, diabetic complications, not only for the foot syndrome, also for renal complications, for example. And um, for us, we actually planned uh, to do a long-term HBO study. It was, it's still very complicated to find participants who are willing to um, yeah, enroll in that study, uh, in that study design as we want to hospitalize participants for 30 days <laughs> and then study them multiple times over that time period, which is almost for everyone, almost impossible to be in a hospital for 30 days in a row. However, we, we would love to do that and also then look um, what is, what is levels, how do levels of oxidative stress differ what does it do um, for tissue? What does it do for um, like wounded tissue? What does it do for um, the, the kidney? Like there would be so many ideas um, to, to look into pathogenesis of uh, diabetic complications and hyperbaric oxygen treatment. Also for neuropathy, but uh, yeah. Thank you. Jan, Jan has a question, but you don't need to <laughs> raise your hand. You're co-chairing. I keep the formal, uh, <laughs> the formal setting. Uh, I was very much interested by the, I actually read uh, quite a few about uh, the concept of, of metahormesis, which was something yeah. which, uh, which was a bit, I would say, uh, neglected, so, uh, neglected so far um, uh, from my <laughs> side. No, no, no. It's, uh, it's very interesting. But if you read about it, it's if I understand it well, uh, we are probably uh, evolutionary uh, uh, well uh, adapted to uh, repeated small bouts of uh, radical oxygen species that uh, treat our tissues somehow. But there is a lot of uh, different ways how to um, uh, actually deliver these ROS to your tissues. And among these is also hypoxia, which is uh, the, the, the complete opposite of uh, what you are delivering to the patients. So uh, just uh, I was uh, an, another is calorie restriction, for instance, uh, which also was shown to somehow um, improve this metahormesis or impact on this uh, on this concept. So uh and now the question is uh do you think that and it actually follows well uh up on what you just said that you prepared the long uh, long term study do you think that there may be this kind of desensitization in repeated bouts of hyperoxygenation uh, that maybe this is a nice acute effect that can be visible even after a couple of days but if we do it repeatedly, maybe we get to from this uh, positive mitohormesis to uh, uh, deleterious ROS uh, effects on the tissues. And uh, do you foresee any possible so desensitization? 
could it be there? That's one question. And another question, could you foresee any safety concerns in long-term uh, HBO treatment? Because we know that the high oxygen, for instance, is not really good for our uh, uh, lungs, uh, for instance, at least what we know from ICU. So do you foresee any possible safety concerns? You probably thought about it when, when preparing this long-term study. Thank you, Jan. So I will start with the second question, um, with, with your second questions. So um, for safety concerns, I really don't think so, because when you go into this chamber, you don't have to imagine you get 100% um, oxygen all the time. So the whole session is for 120 minutes, and every 20 minutes, the 100% oxygen is um, cut down to uh, ambient air level, so 21% oxygen, and then it goes up again after 20 minutes break. So this is like a cycle, it goes up and down so that there is a certain lung protection. And then after um, 120 minutes, it's uh, it's over the whole for the whole day and then the next day again. So there are more complications due to pressure in this chamber actually. So the pressure can actually um, lead to complications of your... Um... Katarina, help me with my English. <laughs> You know, the, the, the pressure within your ears, so you mean, you know, like you, when you go scuba diving, you have you know, yeah, so bar barotrauma. Barotrauma, thank you so much. So it can lead to barotrauma, it can lead, lead to thrombosis or to embolism, it can actually lead to um, bleeding, like so that small vessels that they actually start to bleed. So um, the the pressure issue is, is actually uh, leads to more complications than than actually the the oxygen levels in in the hyperbaric chamber. So not every participant, unfortunately, is able to um, receive treatment HBO treatment. And uh, then your first question about um, is there a desensitizing effect of meat mitohormesis over a longer term? So this hasn't been studied yet, and this would be interesting. What we know from long-term HBO studies regarding um, diabetic foot syndrome is that actually blood glucose levels um, stay low over the whole period. And that also there is an um, insulin sensitizing effect of whole body um, measured by um, HOMA ER. Um, and also for, I think there's one study for 20 days that also did clamp in the end. And they also found that insulin sensitivity is better after like a 20 day um, treatment. So there must be um, reasons for that. And there must be um, an effect of HBO on cellular um, metabolism in general. And I think it's the mitochondria that profits a lot from HBO. However, um, is it only mitohormesis or is it also the perhaps mitohormesis induced and acutely induced better mitochondrial capacity that then actually leads to like a long-term um, or like long-term middle-term increase of um, insulin or yeah, insulin sensitivity because then substrate, substrates are lipotoxicity, lipo lipotoxicity is lower because substrates, substrates are oxidized faster in the mitochondria is mitohormesis only there to kick off the mitochondria and then it doesn't, there's no more effect or does it really have an effect over the whole, over a longer period? This is really the question. Good one. <laughs> Sorry. Well, yeah. that's very interesting. I think it's fascinating because uh, it's a whole world we have to uh, discover. And I have a question. There, there were some subjects uh, uh, whose values, for example, hydro, um, well, uh, hydrogen peroxide skyrocket in the in the white adipose tissue. So uh, they were kind of high responders. The deltas were huge. So did you look at these subjects individually? Uh, were there any differences uh, explaining this, uh, you know, high response? Uh, in uh, in these uh, differences uh, before and after the HPO? Yeah, we actually did also because we're kind of scared as, uh, from some results and we're like, oh my gosh, we poisoned them with oxidative stress. No, but like, like a serious, like a connection or um, 
like a really good association we didn't find because we're also hypothesized it might lead to even lower blood glucose levels or even a better insulin sensitivity or not like vice versa. Um, however, we did not find a real um, connection to glucometabolism and high oxidative stress after HBO. However, we also had a very limited number of participants. And I would say, I think we need a higher number for that to really understand whether there is an association. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the audience? Jan, do you have other questions? Okay. Yeah, I think, yeah, yeah. Please. I, I, I would like to ask one more, but I, I do not want to occupy the whole space. <laughs> uh, I was curious because you showed that um, uh, that uh, glucose oxidation uh, was uh, increased in the uh, during the um, uh, the clamp study. But uh, I did not see any change in um, uh, resting energy expiration, uh, uh, resting energy expenditure, or uh, respiratory quotient uh, between HPO and controls. It was in the in the supplement. Then, um, did you? Uh, which was uh, kind of interesting. Did Thank you, you, Jan. Do you have any ex explanation for that? Yeah. So um, we were also thinking about that, and what we. What we came up with, our hypothesis for this is actually, um, so rate of glucose oxidation goes up. However, um, what we what I didn't show in the results, however, is there a supplement um, rate of lipid oxidation was lower or not increased. So if one goes up and the other down, it might uh, result in, uh, in an equation that, um, or an imbalancing calculation that this is the reason for the unchanged values of rate of energy expenditure in our participants. Um, so I think it's the decrease of the rate of lipid oxygenation actually that um, that we that we see it. Probably this is the, but also probably the intervention is too short to have real effects on energy expenditure in, in general. But um, for us, we thought the higher rates of glucose oxidation, which goes along with lower or is the reason for lower blood glucose levels due to higher um, whole body insulin sensitivity. I have another question. So metformin also again somehow affect mitochondrial respiration and uh, you know the insulin uh, receptor uh, well the transduction and uh, patients were all on metformin and you said not other treatments yeah. right so do you think metformin could somehow have facilitated or you know uh, affected uh, the, um, the outcomes and uh, do you think you should maybe i don't know also try this in patients maybe with the newly diagnosed diabetes who are not on any therapy, you know, to see if there are differences. Yeah, thank you, Katarina. This is a very valuable question because, yes, I think metformin does actually influence um, insulin uh, signaling or in general, like um, the, the blood glucose levels. So in the study, uh, we included very, uh, like, knowingly well-controlled um, diabetics and then also um, who we also wanted to let them be on one or like the most common anti-diabetic medication. But we did not do that only for the group of HBO, but also for the group of control. So as it was a crossover, a randomized study, um, all participants were on the same medication all the time and all participants went into the HPO, HPO group and also went into the control group. So it might, it will have an effect, I'm sure. However, this um, cannot be biased, biasing the results here. Um, in general, we had a problem with ethics to leave out any anti-diabetic medications. So <laughs> we had to settle for one. And um, then we tried to conformly have everyone on the same. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Theresa. I think so. I think we're just on time, 5.45. Are there any other questions? No? So, okay. Jan, you want to close up? Yeah, okay. If you want me to word. 
So Theresia, Katrina, everybody, it was a nice, small, but very interesting, uh, very interesting audience we had and uh, very interesting talk uh, we heard from you. Thank you very much uh, uh, for being here with us. Uh, we are very much, uh, we were very much interested by your results and uh, the talk was fascinating. So this is a very uh, interesting topic, which uh, is now uh, open um, in front of us. Uh, thank you very much, uh, everybody, for uh, for attending um, for attending this uh, EASD Journal Club. Uh, we keep in touch. Uh, you watch and follow uh, our uh, social media and website uh, for uh, other events um, uh, that are ahead. Uh, the first one we will have will be uh, mid January, which will be a webinar. Uh, dealing with uh, all funding possibilities that are now up uh, uh, within the EFSD uh, funding uh, funding body. So it will be very interesting and uh, we'll have a uh, perfect webinar on how to apply for different uh, different funding within uh, the EFSD. And the next journal club uh, will be scheduled in approximately two months. Uh, so uh, we, all, we all keep in touch and uh, I wish you all a nice Advent time, a nice Christmas.